Hey, M0A Nation, Jason here. Welcome to a special live stream, a special webinar. Tonight, we're talking, we're learning more about this series we have been in. It is The Secret to Perfect Landings. Maybe you're watching now on YouTube or on Facebook. Let's give you all a little shout out over here, over on YouTube. Hey, to Steve Hammond, good to see you. Buddy Harrison in Tampa. Hey, buddy, not too far from you. Um, Mario Angelo, Alex Nunez, great to see you. Username Pilot Jared, awesome to see you over there. Hey, my buddy Dave G, Peter Schuster, my buddy Eric in Seattle, awesome to see you. How about Facebook? What's happening over there? Ben Howard, um, Randy. Awesome to see you, my good friend, my, my fellow uh, One Day TBM owner. Jeff is on here. Murad is on here. Hey, Jeff, good to see you. Jeff in New York, that is. Um, Cody, Bradley, Mike Smith. The comments are coming in so fast, I'm trying to keep up. Daniel, Terry, outstanding. Lance Brown, Northern California, over on YouTube. Ronnie Collins, uh, Paul, Lance, uh, Coppin. Awesome to see you all. Hey, Telvin, my friend, awesome to see you on Facebook. m 0 Nation, we have an outstanding presentation for you all tonight. It's on a topic that we're all trying to get better and better at. That is the secret to perfect landings. And this is something we've been talking about for many years. For some of you, this is going to be a great refresher. For others of you, this may be the light bulb moment to help really click it all together. Now, I know that so many of you here know M0A.com. Maybe you're already in the M0A Nation Facebook group, and I just want to thank you for that. Those of you who are choosing to take uh, time from your evening when you should be with your families, with your friends, resting, whatever that may be, studying for a knowledge test or a, a check ride maybe, you're finding time right now to better yourself as a pilot. And as you know, M0A.com, we are all about mastery. And I applaud you. You would all be each other's best friends because you're just taking time now to better yourselves and pursue mastery. You may know m 0 for our outstanding online ground school, the YouTube, the Facebook videos, um, the Fun Friday videos, the making of, whatever it may be. But I hope that when you think of m 0 you think of a group of pilots who are always working to pursue mastery, and you are a part of that m 0 family. Here in the studio, we have some of our outstanding m 0 team. Hey, m 0 team, good to see you all. We are properly set. Hey, hey, Wayne, Wayne, Wayne. Hey, we're live, Wayne. Hey, hey. Oh, oh, Wayne's awake. Okay, just double checking, <laughs> making sure Wayne's awake over there. Um, Wayne, Sarah, Amanda, Lauren, all properly socially distanced. Don't you worry, uh, making all the magic happen. They're in the chats right now, as well as some of our great remote team. So just an absolutely a phenomenal team that works so hard to bring you this amazing content. So thank you, team, for working on that. Also behind the scenes, Matt's helping me with comments, everything else. I've got them in my ear. In fact, hold on, hold on. Someone's coming in my earpiece now. It's Wayne. Wayne says he's actually going to pay attention tonight to, so he doesn't blow tires and shut down Fort Lauderdale anymore. Wayne, is that true? Is that, is that, is that true? Uh, we, uh, we muted you anyways, Wayne. We don't want to, we don't want to hear from you anyways. I'm just... <laughs> I'm just teasing. If you don't know the story, Wayne shut down Fort Lauderdale International Airport uh, with a blown tire from a hard landing. Um, he blames the instructor. I blame the student. We'll see what happens. But Wayne, I want to formally dedicate this webinar to you. We love you. He's our office dad. <laughs> M0A Nation, let's get into the content now. Enough making fun of Wayne. You see me make fun of Wayne. You don't see how many times Wayne makes fun of me, too. Okay, I, I, I get bullied by Wayne. That's what it is. Hey, M0A Nation, in the chats, I have a question for you. What makes a great landing? Just let me know in the chat. Tell me what makes a great landing. Hey, Eric Deagle, uh, what makes a great landing? That is what I am after here. Just let me know in the chat. Type in the chat. What makes a great landing? Why did Wayne put in the YouTube chat, anyone know a good instructor? He thinks he's funny. He thinks he's funny. What makes a great landing? Adam Thomas on YouTube says a great approach. I got a bunch of air speeds from Ocon, Pilot Jared. Um, I can't see the username from here, but it says a great pilot. Well, that could be part of it. Oh, 
My friend Deborah says a perfect pattern. Oh, Jim Porterfield, everyone's favorite. Um, Jeff Gerard says a perfect pattern. Jim Porterfield, everyone loves Jim Porterfield. He was actually Tom Cruise's stand-in for Top Gun 2. So he knows a thing or two about perfect landings. Tara, great to see you over here. Um, Mito says a talented pilot. It does a little bit uh, to that. Eric Deagle on Facebook says Wayne is not at the controls. Don't worry, Wayne. He must be talking about a different Wayne. There's no way he's talking about you. Um, Hassan on YouTube uh, says good traffic, great pattern, says my friend Efren. Okay, so this is, this is good. We know what it takes to make a great landing. We have so many of these ingredients that you're covering here with me. Then what makes landing so difficult? You all, we could, we could just wrap the webinar right now. You all just shared some of the secrets to a perfect landing. But let me ask you another question. Why are landings so difficult then? What makes landings so challenging, right? That's what I want to know. Let's look at the chats um, now here um, and see. Um, Andrew, I see you have a few questions on YouTube. I'll do Q&A at the very end. You save those, type them up now and paste them at the end. I'll answer any questions you have, my friend. My buddy Brad in uh, Wisconsin. Uh, it's a great landing is one you can walk away from. That's the honest truth. But what makes them so difficult here? Kevin says consistency. Kevin, you are, you are right about that. Kevin, remind me, let's talk about different approaches at different airports when ATC has me extend my down one. Let's talk about those factors here. Um, someone says uh, changing winds, changing weights. What a good point. Gosh, anybody, uh, show of hands, first solo, your instructor forgot to tell you they weighed 200 pounds, and when they got out of the airplane, the thing was like a rocket, <laughs> and you floated forever. Right? Any, anybody, show of hands, anybody else, type in me in the chat if that was you on your first solo going, whoa, this thing's fast without you in it. That's how I felt on my first solo here. Um, let's look at some more here. Um, finding some more. Vincent, appropriate management of the slow flight. Ooh, Vincent, Vincent, you were our top fans. Thank you for that. Look at all the me's coming in over on YouTube. I I'm glad it wasn't just me. It is a true struggle. All the me's coming in on Facebook as well. Um, some other things that make it difficult. Larry's talking about the dynamic environment. Telvin talks about the wind. Eric Deagle says he makes the landings difficult. Is it true that sometimes landings are all in our head as well? Anybody ever done like, oh, you know what? I am just going to do like 10 you know, traffic patterns today. I'm going to be in the pad. I'm going to do 10 landings. You get to about landing six and you're like, I am so tired. I'm going to sleep so good tonight. I, you just mentally check out. Eric, that's, that's me too sometimes with that. All right. Ooh, Eric Frank. Great point. He says he hates right base turns. How about just right traffic as a whole? Right traffic can make landings difficult. Absolutely it can. Pilot Ben Crawley. Good to see you, man. Uh, he says all the different variables. You're right. There are so many different variables. Now, if you've been following M0A.com for any amount of time, you've probably heard the story, but I realize we have new, new, uh, new fans, new family members that are, are on this journey now pursuing mastery with us. So for some of you, let me refresh your memory. For others, this may be your first time hearing the story. But I almost quit flight training. Let me tell you the story. I was a brand spanking new um, pilot. I, I was probably, you know, maybe 10 hours into it and I was flying 6711 Juliet, a 1967 Cherokee 140. I had an amazing instructor. She gave me a lot of tough love. If, if Steve, my buddy from Dinellon is watching this, Steve knows exactly what I'm talking about when I say she gave tough love. She loved you, but boy, was she tough on you. And we were working around um, the traffic pattern and at Ocala, there's a tiny little runway, eight and two six. It's but maybe 3,000 feet long. It's maybe 50 feet wide. It is the tiniest little runway. I'm used to laying on a 1836, this big 150 foot wide, almost 8,000 foot runway, super easy. And my instructor said to me, Jason, if you can land on runway eight and two six, I'll solo you. Here I am. I'm, I'm all about this. I'm 16 years old. I'm going, this is awesome. I am going to solo. You know, that maybe that macho hazardous attitude snuck in a little bit. And here I am on final for runway eight and two six. And I am way over here. And then I'm way over here. And I, I was practicing S turns before I knew they were a ground reference maneuver, but I was doing them at 400 feet on final. I am all over the place. 
I'm just nervous. This is a new runway. She gave me the pressure of, you can solo. I have to do this in my mind. I'm all over final. I am now so far left of center line, left of final. I'm talking, the gr I'm past the taxiway. If you're familiar with Ocala, the grass and everything is, is underneath me. And finally, I'm about 25 feet. The runway's over there, and I'm heading this direction. And my instructor looks at me and says, Jason, what are you going to do? And I thought, well, you know, I really want to land this airplane solo, but uh, I guess I should go around. She says, I think that's a great decision. So I executed what I thought was my go-around procedure. You see, the Cherokee 140 has manual flaps. You know, the little, I call them like the emergency brake flaps. Remember the emergency brakes in the minivans, right, that come up, or a car? I grabbed the flaps, or 30 degrees of flaps, were at idle, 25 feet above the runway, and I took all the flaps out at once. What do you think happened, old 6711 Juliet, 25 feet above the ground, the grass, with no power in, when I took out all the flaps at once? Well, my instructor very quickly got on the controls, gave it full power, tried to save it. She probably certainly softened a very, very abrupt landing as I literally froze, as I saw the ground just coming up, sinking. We smashed into the ground. It had been much harder, but they hadn't mowed in a few days, and it was the summertime, so the grass was awfully tall. So my first soft field landing was um, unintentional, we can say. My instructor said words that I cannot uh, repeat here because this is a kid-friendly PG-13 program. She took the control. She taxied us. We popped back up on the taxiway over onto the runway, back taxied. Uh, Ocala had, had no tower at this time, and we taxied in, and it was dead quiet. The most awkward silence. My hands were just shaking. I was so nervous. The adrenaline was pumping. The nerves were pumping. I wanted to cry. I want all these things. And I will never forget, we are taxiing all the way in. We get to our little spot on the ramp. She does all the shutdown. There wasn't even a checklist. She was just shutting down. She was so mad at me. And we shut down and she opens up the door and looks at me and says, Jason, maybe you're not meant to be a pilot. What do, you, what do you say to that? I told you it was tough love. It, it, was, it was from a place of love. And, and that's just, that's just how, how she was. Amazing, amazing human, amazing, amazing instructor, but gave some tough love. I learned many, many years later, she actually called my parents and said, hey, listen, I told Jason this. I, I didn't mean it. Um, he needs to get back out here. But I didn't hear that story literally till years later. I went home, still living with my parents. I'm 16 years old. And I just cried. I remember just crying and thinking, she said, I'm not meant to be a pilot. And my parents and it gave me the, the pep talk to get back to it and get to it. And both encouraged me that how can you, Jason, turn this failure into an advantage? How can you turn this failure into perhaps your greatest success story? So I made a choice. Before I went back for that next lesson, I had to get serious and I had to become a student of landings. This is well before YouTube and everything else. All I had was the pilot's handbook of aeronautical knowledge and any books I could get my hands on, but I had to become a student of landings. What made for a great landing? What made landings difficult? The same questions I asked you, those are the questions I began to ask myself. And I find that when you ask the right questions, you find the right answers. And in my discovery, I found that there were two things that really held me back from making perfect landings. And the first one you saw yesterday in a YouTube video. It's this idea that a perfect landing starts with a perfect traffic pattern. That video I posted yesterday, I, obviously I try to keep YouTube videos short and to the point. I didn't get to share my full heart and my full ideas with this. I gave you the sports analogy of a basketball player coming to approach a free throw. You see, they do the same thing every time. Watch, pick a particular player out, and you'll watch them. They approach the free throw line. Maybe for them, it's they dribble three times, spin the ball once their hands, bend the knees, and they shoot, right? Someone else has a different routine. But their goal, whether it's home court, away court, it doesn't matter. It's to make that free throw feel and act the same each and every time. A golfer has a, 
18 different environments in, in, in one match, right? One day, really. And they change from day to day with hole position, yet they line up their putt the same way every single time. They read the green the same way. They approach the ball the same way, the same stance, the same grip. But things change, right? The pressure they need to apply on the putter changes. What they need to read the slopes and the greens, it all changes here. And our landings change as well. Just like for the basketball player, home court to away court, it changes. Because sometimes ATC extends our downwind. Sometimes, well, it's right traffic, like you all were alluding to earlier. Yet I need to do everything within my power to systematize this approach, this pattern, to make it the same every single time. Whether it's right traffic, whether it's left traffic. We're gonna do a little chair flying here in a moment, and I'll help you do that. The main goal is I wanna be at the same point in my traffic pattern. Even if ATC gives me this long straight in, I wanna be at the same point in that traffic pattern. Maybe I'm always at 400 feet AGL here. Well, when I turn base and I'm turn final, I still wanna be at that 400 AGL a half mile away from the runway. So whether I make a, four, a, a straight in or a left or a right traffic pattern, this is my 400 foot point and that doesn't change for me. You understand what I'm saying? When you're making this traffic pattern, it's got to be that rectangular traffic pattern. Assuming you're able to make that rectangular traffic pattern, there's no trapezoids. There are no shortcuts. There's no popping in on the base at a pilot-controlled airport. Now, ATC could certainly give that to you, but there's no shortcuts. There's no, oh, I'll just fly the down one a little tighter today. I need to get down. There's, there's weather coming. There's this, what, whatever that may be. There's no shortcuts with that option. In fact, I wanna actually show you um, an animation of what I mean and how we need to adapt and adjust to how the wind is playing here. You can see we're on a 45 to down one. Let's say the wind is behind us and look to the front of the airplane to see our wind correction angle. So on the downwind, remember, as we're managing our airspeed, I have a tailwind. I'll be flying much faster. Now, when I get ready to turn my base, what actually happens here? I have a crosswind. So I might have the tiniest little crab to the left. Now, let's go ahead, let's turn final now. Now I'm back into the nice um, headwind here. This is the upwind if I'm taking off final if I'm landing. Let's keep the rectangular course coming around just so you can see it because I take off, I turn my left crosswind next. I go ahead, I turn that left crosswind, I need to be crabbing and adjusting for that wind, or I'm cheating distance already on my downwind. Are you appropriately crabbing in the traffic pattern to compensate for things like wind? Even on the downwind, maybe I have something, maybe I have a crosswind that I'm dealing with. I need to adjust that angle as well. Maybe I'm on the downwind dealing with a nasty crosswind. Am I creeping in too close to this runway? Am I creeping too far away from this runway? I need to be able to map that out. You all know me, I am a big fan of chair flying. So I want you right now to chair fly this with me. When I say chair fly, I mean I chair fly everything. Emergency procedures, radio communications, all these things, all these items we can chair fly. I want you to chair fly a perfect traffic pattern with me here. Let's go ahead and let's just do it from takeoff, okay? Let's take off runway 36 at the Ocala Airport. So we pull out onto runway 36, ATC clears us for takeoff. My heels hit the floor, my toes move to the bottom of those pedals. I smoothly apply some full power. I glance at my airspeed indicator. For me from the right seat, it's a far glance. Glance at my airspeed indicator, airspeed's alive. Back to my engine instruments, engine gauges, green. This is my procedure. I want you, whether you're writing this down, this will be recorded if you want to come back to this as well to write down a good procedure. I'm rolling down the runway. I reach rotation speed. I rotate. I, I don't rip the controls back. I don't baby the controls back. I'm properly trimmed. It takes, I can fly this thing with just two fingertips to get this airplane to actually take off. 
climbing out, I just do a nice VY as my V speed on my climb out. I continue to climb out. I'll use my peripheral vision, my left and my right, to make sure I'm keeping the runway underneath me. In some rare occasions, I'll look behind me if I have a back window to make sure I'm flying that runway straight out because you realize I could be holding 3.6 all day on my head and indicator and my compass, but the winds could be pushing me. I'm still holding 3.6, but I'm not flying. I'm, my perfect pattern's already all screwed up. Usually you can just accomplish that by kind of looking out and looking down on either side to help you with that. I'm flying on out just for ease sake. Let's say AGL, MSL are one and the same, which they just about are at the Ocala airport. We'll just go up to a thousand feet. So with AGL and MSL being the same for this analogy, we climb on out to 500 feet. Life is looking good. Double check my engine gauges. All is good. I get to 700 feet. I turn left crosswind. Nice standard rate turn. Maintaining my climb. If this was a pilot controlled and uncontrolled airport, by the way, this is where I would make my turn. Uh, I'm sorry, make my radio call is in the turn. It's easier to spot a banking aircraft with that. So it would be, let's say Ocala Towers closed. Uh, Ocala Traffic, Skyhawk 23 Mike Zulu's turning left crosswind runway uh, 36 at Ocala. When I say I'm turning left crosswind, the crosswind's a big chunk of airspace. If I'm turning left crosswind, other traffic knows exactly where to look. So as I continue, I turn my crosswind, I continue climbing, I get to about 950 feet. And that's when I start to kind of bring the throttle back just a little bit here, start to push that nose forward and anticipate, go ahead and anticipate leveling off at a thousand feet. And when I say bring that throttle back uh, 2100, 2200, there is no need to be racing through this traffic pattern. Now, usually you time it out just right that by the time you level off, it's time to turn downwind. I'd turn my left downwind. If this was a pilot controlled, uncontrolled airport, I'd also make the radio call. Ocala traffic, Skyhawk 23 Mike Zulu's turn left downwind runway 36, Ocala. Turning left downwind. Because if I just call up and say I'm downwind, whoa, downwind's a huge chunk of airspace. Turning left downwind, everyone knows where I'm at the hinge of the crosswind and the downwind. And by the way, it is way easier to spot a banking aircraft than it is to spot a level aircraft. Do you follow me with that? On downwind, this is where I need to manage things. This is where I need to manage my airspeed because I actually have a tailwind. On downwind, I'm asking myself a very important question. Let's just say I'm on a left downwind. Am I creeping in on that runway? Meaning, am I creeping closer to that runway? Or am I creeping away from that runway? Because I need to maintain center. For my aircraft, and I used to do this for students, in the, I mostly fly high-wing aircraft, students would always say, how do I know how far out on the downwind? And I tried to get them to eyeball it. You know what I did one day? I got some painter's tape, and I went out to the strut, and I knew where I was used to seeing it, and I made a range from about here on the strut to here on the strut. And I said, hey, we're going to go fly. We're going to do a few laps in the pattern. Put the runway in between the two lines of painter's tape. And you better believe it every single student thereafter, they now know, no matter which runway you go to, they know where they should be on the downwind. Not too far, not too close, where a proper 172 downwind should be. They put the runway in between the painter's tape. It worked out perfectly. So they could see if they're creeping in or creeping away based on what the wind's doing or what their heading is actually doing. Uh, this is a time too. I want you to bring that throttle on back. Let the wind push you. You can get down to 2,000, 2,100 RPMs here. Bring that throttle back a little bit. Let the wind do the work, assuming it's a true downwind, a true tailwind, and it's pushing you through. Then when we get a beam or touchdown point, a beam, our touchdown point, this is when the procedure really starts. Now, when I say a beam, I mean off, 90 degrees off my shoulder. And I said my touchdown point, not my aiming point. My touchdown and my aiming point are two very different things. My procedure continues. I'm going to go ahead, car repeat, power back. When I say power back, 1,700, like a good RPM for a run-up is a good place to bring it back to. And 10 degrees of flaps but you have to be so careful here. Team, Missouri Nation, Missouri Family, when I'm flying and I add in 10 degrees of flaps, where does my nose want to go? Just for a second, it wants to go up. Why does it want to go up? Well, 
a flap is extending the surface area of the wing. It makes the wing bigger. Thus, first it generates more lift before it catches up to generate the drag I need. And I see student pilot after student pilot, and we're all student pilots, make the mistake that it being their touchdown point, car peep, power back, 10 degrees of flaps, the nose comes up, they kind of fight it for a bit or miss it for a bit. It's now time to turn base at our 45 degree point, and they're still at 1,000 feet AGL. They never lost any altitude. You should lose roughly 200 feet between your beam point and before you actually turn your base. Now, before we continue chair flying this, I need you to understand the second point here. It's that airspeed is king. Airspeed above all else. Here's what I typically like to do in my aircraft. This is for 2-3 Mike Zulu. Find out what works for your aircraft. For a Cirrus, this would be very slow, as Jeff and I were talking about um, a few weeks ago. Uh, Jeff Gerard and I. 90 on downwind is about where I want to be. 80 on base. 70 on final. And 65 slow into 60 crossing on to airport property. That's what works for me in 2-3 Mike Zulu. You need to find out what works for you. But those are the target numbers I'm shooting for. I've got a long downwind to slow this airplane back. 2-3 Mike Zulu may not look like it, but it is a slippery airplane. And any of my team here will tell you, she's a little hard to slow down sometimes on the downwind. The wind is pushing you. That's why I said earlier to bring that throttle on back when it concerns that. So continuing to go ahead and work through that. Slowing down to understand airspeed is king. So back to our chair flying, we're just a beam our touchdown point, car peak power back to 1700, roughly, wherever you do your run up, 10 degrees of flaps. Make sure you start the descent down. You should lose about 200 feet. You should be at 800 feet AGL when you're getting ready to turn base. And then we go ahead, when our, when our touchdown point, not our aiming point, when our touchdown point is a 45 degree entry back. That's when we go ahead and we make it. So you don't have to get out your protractors and everything else and make this perfect angle. You can eyeball it. 45 degrees off the, your back shoulder. That's when we go ahead and turn base. On base, I'm continuing to lose altitude. On base, I am just babying the power back. Just, just millimeters at a time. Don't leave it at 1700. By now, you should have babied it back to maybe 1600, assuming we're good altitude wise. We continue just to kind of baby this thing back. Now, on base, if I need it, depending on wind, everything else, I'm going to add my next notch of flaps. Now, I saw someone post this uh, earlier, I think it was yesterday in the M0A Nation Facebook group. And by the way, if you're not in the M0A Nation Facebook group, you should be. M0A team, if you can post a link to, on YouTube and Facebook for everybody uh, to get in there, we'd love to have you in there. Someone asked the question, should I or can I add flaps in, in a turn? It depends how you phrase the question. Should you? The answer is no. Can you? Yeah, you can, but it's not a good idea. Let me explain why. I am not a fan of flaps in, in a turn. Let's use the base to final as an example. Base to final. I'm low. I'm slow. I am making my turn now from base to final, let's say. I want to add in to 30 degrees of flaps. Flaps have a tendency to make the nose do what? Come up. I'm low, slow, in a turn. I'm about to add, one wing is producing more lift than the other. So one wing is going to produce more drag than the other. If I'm going to add drag to the equation, it's just a byproduct of that. And I add the flaps in and the tendency is for the nose to come up, right? Can you see there's just too many factors of what could go wrong? Can it be done? Sure, it can be done. If you know what you're doing, I just wouldn't recommend it because it's so easy to go, man, I am blowing through final right now. I am working through this. It is just, I'm trying to save it here. I'm adding flaps. I'm a little bit too high. It's just so easy to end up really messing things up with that and you end up hurting yourself. I need you to be careful with that. So I am not a fan of flaps in, in a turn. It can be done. I'm just not a fan of it. Back to our chair flying. I'm on base. Power's back to maybe 1600 now. I've added, I'm at 20 degrees of flaps. And I'm watching. And I'm looking out my window. I'm looking at that runway because now I need to time this turn. I don't want to turn too early. I don't want to turn too late. I need to turn at just the right point and standard rate. No overbanking, no trying to save it. You can go around at any point on this approach, as you know. 
I want you to make that nice smooth turn to final, roll out on final, and by the way, in the left seat, put that center line on your right shoulder. Right seaters, future CFIs and CFIs, put that center line on the center of your chest or the middle of your nose, however you want to do it. That's where the center line goes in the right seat. Now on final, you need to ask yourself the following question. Am I too high? Am I too low? Or am I right on glide path? I used to do this way back in the day. Joel, if you're watching, I apologize in advance because Joel was one of my very early aviation mentors. He's who I bought uh, 23 Mike Zulu um, from. Joel, uh, I did something bad to your training 172s way back in the day. Whenever I had students who struggled with judging too high, too low uh, on final, I went to, I don't know, Michael's or Walmart or whatever craft section of a store, got uh, one of those charcoal pencils, and I would take it on the windshield, Joel, cover your ears for this part because it was your windshield, and I would draw a big circle, and I'd say, put your aiming point, your touchdown point, your aiming point, whatever you want to choose, the runway numbers, let's say, put the runway numbers in this circle, and they'd fly. It was like, this is like early heads-up display kind of stuff. This is like top-notch technology, and they could actually see. If I pick that point on the runway, I can see if the runway numbers, like look at this image here, I can look and see on this image, if I'm using the runway numbers, what happens if those runway numbers start creeping up your screen right now? You're too low. What if these runway numbers start to disappear a little bit here? I'm too high. You see, I'm not recommending anybody go draw on their windshield. That is not what I am recommending here. What I'm recommending is you just pick a point in space instead of drawing on your windshield and aim for it and use that to know, am I too high, am I too low, to pick your aiming point and work through it. And we keep coming on down. And still be mindful, your feet are always very important on the rudders. They're about to get even more important here. Because I need to share with you, gosh, perhaps what is the most important step and it's one, actually, I have a video coming out on it next week. I need you to watch it. It is really, really good. Um, it, it hurts my heart a little bit because I had to show this on video. and It was a hard landing to show. I need you to ditch the word flare from your vocabulary. Hear me out before you say, Jason, you lost me on this one. Hear me out. Ditch the word flare from your vocabulary because what do you think of when you think of a flare? I know there's not many 747s flying much anymore, but a 747 comes in and flares. Anybody remember watching the space shuttle land? Boy, was that ever a flare. A 172 doesn't approach like this. How I came to this realization is I had a student back when I was flying in Jacksonville a lot, again, back in Joel's planes, and he was doing great. First lesson. And I let students take off, uh, come in, do most of the landings, and get them real, real hyped up and positive about flying. We're coming in, and he's, he's solid. I'm thinking, I'm going to let this guy land this airplane. He is flying awesome right now. Big flight simmer, so it, that translates over quite well. We get down to about 25 feet, and I say, okay, let's flare. I cannot make this up. He wasn't a very tall gentleman. He locked his knees out on the pedals and took that yoke all the way back to his chest. And I promise you, that airplane, it was 1180 Mike. We shot up to the moon and I just gave it power and we just kept on climbing like we were a banner towing airplane. <laughs> and we just did a banner pick at that point because that's probably what it looked like to tower when we went through. And after we came around, I showed him the land. I asked him, like, what happened there? And he said, well, Jason, when you say flare, like I think of when I'm flying on United or I'm flying on Delta and they come in and they flare. I, I love watching the space shuttle, he says. And that thing comes in and it flares. So when you told me to flare, that's what I thought we did. I said, wow, no, we, we, we don't flare. I mean, I'm not saying I want a three-point landing. So I had to come up with another word. And I thought, gosh, what do we really do? What is really happening when we touch down? I thought, I've, I've got it. Why do we practice slow flight? I always thought, it was always taught to me, we practice slow flight just to kind of learn about the stall warning horn and learn about the slow characteristics of this airplane. That's what I thought. And I couldn't have been more incorrect. We practice slow flight to get better at landings. You see, if you want to get better at landings in that transition phase, Go practice your slow flight first. An altitude you do way up, or I'm sorry, a maneuver you do way up at altitude 
is what's going to benefit you down at 25 feet. Slow flight is the secret. Because in slow flight, you learn that the ailerons are not very effective when you're on that yoke, are they? They're not doing much. My rudders though, wow, they have some authority in slow flight. My elevator too, not a whole lot of pitch back there. So that's interesting. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna change the word. We need to change it to transition. We transition to like you wish to fly slow flight down the runway. You see slow flight in the dirty configuration. You're never at this really high pitch up where you just can't see anything. In fact, if you're coming into land and you can't see the runway in front of you, you're pitched up way too much. I'm not advocating a three point landing. The mains absolutely touch down first followed shortly by the nose. As you transition the nose up to fly like you wanna fly slow flight, and you saw our video on slow flight down the runway, I hope two weeks ago. If not, please go find it on YouTube and Facebook. As you transition the nose up, transition your eyes down the runway. How far? Five, six, seven, a thousand feet. Look at the tree line for all that matters. Look down the runway. Anybody, type in me in the chat if this applies to you. Anybody ever have the ground sneak up on them? I'm coming into land, man. This thing is looking so good. All of a sudden, boom. Oh, that was sooner than I expected. I, didn't expect, I knew the ground was coming. I just didn't know it was right there. Me, I've done it before, right? The ground snuck up on me, we say. And it wasn't a nighttime landing without a landing light. It was a daytime landing. It's all about where you put your eyes. I am telling you, if the ground is sneaking up on you, if the ground is sneaking up on you, it's because you're not taking your eyes far enough down that runway. Look at all the me's coming in on YouTube and coming on Facebook. Hey, John Rich, hey, Jim Furman, good to see you. Um, my friend Robbie, good to see you as well. Yeah, the ground sneaks up on you sometimes. It's all because you are probably looking just over the cowling. You are looking at the next center line stripe when you should be looking at the tree line. Use your peripheral vision to help you maintain center line. Now, Lastly here, then I'm gonna share some tips, then I'll, I'll get to your, your questions here. We're almost done, team. I give Wayne a very, very hard time. And I, we, we love Wayne, he is our office dad. Right now he's going, where is Jason going with this? I'm not picking on Wayne. Um, that, we'll save that for the next webinar. Wayne had a hard time at the end, when we, and it's not just Wayne, gosh, so many pilots have this issue. Coming into land, and right before touchdown, we'd land left of center. Who else, again, type in me in the chat, who else has a problem that life is good, I'm on center line, but I always touch down left of center. Why do I always touch down left of center? It was me for a while. It was Wayne for a while until we worked it out. If you find yourself touching down left of center, it's because you have lazy feet. I, I don't know how else to put it to you. You think in your mind, or we think in our mind, look at all the me's, everybody. I'll talk about those that land on the right as well. But if you land left, you got lazy feet because you are forgetting left turning tendencies are still happening to this airplane. There are four left turning tendencies, right? The torque effect. Torque effect happens at high engine RPM, so that's not the case. P factor happens. P factor, but we're at a lower angle attack, so that's not as much the case. Gyroscopic precession, that's, that's 90 degrees felt here, really felt over there. That's not as much the case. Do you know what's happening the most? Spiraling slipstream. You see, as our propeller spins, it creates this ribbon of air around our airplane that comes back and impacts our vertical stabilizer. And when it impacts the vertical stabilizer, it pushes us. It just yaws us slightly, which causes us just to barely drift this way. You need just the tiniest, tiniest bit of right rudder. That's all it is. A little bit of right rudder, a little bit of aileron to counterbalance it if you find yourself landing left of center. If you find yourself landing right of center, you are too strong in the foot department. You feel that left turning tendency and you go to correct it, but you're correcting it too much. You could, I, I've never done this, but I would imagine you could push probably with one finger on that rudder pedal to give it the amount of rudder pressure it needs to keep you lined up on center line. Now, it, hear me out. You cannot put just rudder in to fix it because if you put just rudder in to fix it, you're gonna land like this. I was like this, now I'm like this, and you're gonna side load the airplane and you're gonna blow tire after tire because you're gonna pull them off the bead. You have to add the tiniest bit of right rudder 
and you have to counterbalance it with a little bit of left aileron to straighten it out. That's what you need to do. I'm talking millimeters, the tiniest bit, a pound of pressure here and a pound of pressure there, that's all it needs. If you find yourself landing left of center, how can you practice that? Because here's the other problem. Landings, this transition period is about 10 seconds and I'm down on the ground. 10 seconds is enough to practice this over and over and over. This is why one of my best landing tips is to do slow flight down the runway. You need to go check the video out from two weeks ago. Find the longest runway you can, get down into ground effect, hold those wheels just inches off that ground. You're gonna to need to give it a little bit of power, but practice slow flight down the runway. Practice tracking that center line. Feel how the rudders feel. Feel how the yoke and the ailerons feel, how the elevator feels. You don't have as much control authority with the yoke as you thought, but you sure have a lot with the rudder pedals as well. Slow flight down the runway. Next, remember you need to take your eyes down that runway. And remember, airspeed is king. You can throw all these great tips out the window. If you wanna cross the airport fence at 85, you are gonna float forever. You can throw all these great tips out the window if you wanna cross the airport fence at 45 too, because you're gonna stall and you're gonna smash into that ground real, real hard. They're not gonna call the NTSB, but you're gonna be calling the A&P mechanic instead for three flat tires uh, and a bent fuselage is what's gonna happen. Airspeed is king. Aim for a perfect pattern. And please, please, please remember just through all of this, hear me out, test it before you, you try it. Ditch the word flare from your vocabulary. The space shuttle flared. 747s, I know there's hardly any of them flying, it's sad now. Used to flare, I guess it's past tense now, right? So that's what I want you to focus on, transition to slow flight. Next week's video, I flare Mike Sulu and we hit hard. In there, actually, well, what you don't see in the video is I, I hit so hard, I went up, my headset hit the hit the roof, which isn't hard to do at this height. It clicked my A and R off and kind of dug into the top of my head a little bit. They cut that part out of the video. We we hit hard, and then I come around and show you a nice, even level transition. So there you have it, the secret to perfect landings. M0A family, if this has been of benefit to you, if you need help with a knowledge test, with check ride prep, or maybe you just say, listen, Jason, I've tried other courses. Uh, your teaching style works for me. Before you spend any money with us, I want you to check out our course. Take a free two-week trial of our course at m0atrial.com. No strings attached. Um, one membership gets you access to all our courses, private, instrument, commercial, and FOI, fundamentals of instruction and just check it out, take a spin through it. Geez, in two weeks you could knock out uh, a knowledge test if you wanted to. But you all know we're not in the business of just passing knowledge tests. We're not in the business of just passing check rides. We're in the business of making safer, smarter pilots. And we're only interested in pilots who are pursuing mastery. That's just the honest truth. So with that, I wanna open it up for your questions. Any questions, any comments you all have, now is your time in the chat here. I've got the chat window pulled up in front of me. Stuart says, thank you, Jason, this was great. Thank you, Alan, thank you. Uh, Milano, thank you. Um, let's see over here. Hey, David G uh, on YouTube, he says, remember that sight view before you took off when landing your nose should be a little bit higher than that. Yeah, I, I love it. Um, Eli over on YouTube as well. Thank you for the kind words with that. Again, thank you everyone. Really appreciate the kind words. Hey, this is your time. Anything question wise, it doesn't have to relate to landings. I will chat about anything you wish to chat about. Robbie Dillon, thank you. I'm glad that comes through with that. Justin, great to see you. Hey, Josh says, great lesson, Jason. Your course made my FAA written test so much easier. You and Josh, it's funny, we're looking at the stats. The FAA average for private pilot is an 82%. The M0A member average, 88%. Talk about, we show up to a check ride, 88% is our average that our students get. It's, it's pretty killer, something I'm really, really proud of. We're working to improve that every single day. Uh, LA Tech 15 asked two watches. Oh, it's a long explanation. Um, maybe, uh, maybe some of the M0A team in the chat can go find that video. I think it's on Remote Pilot 101, why two watches. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty funny story. You can check that one out. Um, Pilot Jared said, how do I deal with wind shear? Pilot Jared, full power go around. If I had a go around button, that's what I would do. 
<laughs> I'm not dealing. I want nothing to do with wind shear. I am going around. I've had that happen just a few times. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, Stuart says, my issue is being uh, too high on base. I'm fearful of the death spiral. Stuart, you keep positive airflow. You keep pushing that nose forward. Keep that nose coming down. Don't add flaps in, in a turn. Keep that airspeed looking good and you'll be fine. There is no death spiral, my friend. You keep that nose down. You keep that airplane flying. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. Tyson asked for quick tips for the private pilot check ride. Tyson, absolutely, my friend. First and foremost, Tyson, look at your knowledge test. Go look at your ACS codes because that's where your examiner is starting. On everyone's knowledge tests, they publish the subject codes that you got incorrect. Go do a Google search for those subject codes because the examiner knows them all and that's where he or she is going to start on your check ride. As far as day before the check ride, Tyson, you are the pilot in command. 91 CFR 91.3 says you have the final authority as the safety and responsibility for that flight. Don't forget your passenger briefs. Don't forget a good thorough pre-flight. You're teaching everything along the entire way. Treat them as a passenger with that. Get a good night's rest the night before. Uh, be well rested, ready to go with that. You're gonna, um, next time I see you, it'll be in the Missouri Nation group holding up that temporary certificate with a photo, Tyson. So I'm looking forward to that. Let's find some more questions. They're kind of flying in here. So let me work with um, this. Um, let's find some here. How do you deal with wind gusts on a power off 180? Andy on Facebook. Andy, excellent question. Gosh, power off 180s are so tough. We used to joke in the Piper Arrow. Where is the Piper Arrow going to land in a power off 180? You throw a brick out the window and you follow it because that's where, <laughs> that's where the arrow goes. No, Piper Arrow is an amazing airplane. Just power off 180s were tough. You, you had a turn and bank quick on that one. I teach the time method. It depends on the aircraft, but typically I can time it. In 2-3 Mike Zulu, I got to beam my touchdown point, car repeat, power all the way back, 10 seconds, 10, 9, and we go through. Then I make my turn on in, and I don't commit to flaps until I'm ready for it. The question was, how do I deal with wind? It goes back to flaps. Do not add flaps until you know you have that runway made. And don't forget, if, flaps, um, if slips with flaps extended are allowed, slips are a very, very good friend. Keep that nose coming forward, though, as you do it. You can slip for two things. You can slip to lose altitude. You can slip to lose airspeed. You can't slip for both at the same time. That's how you hurt yourself. So remember that here. Okay, um, let's find some more here. Vincent over on Facebook. Jason, can you speak to short final? Talk about taking power out all the way down to idle. Where should you idle the power? Love it. Okay, let's chat about it. I kind of left you hang on the chair flying, so we bring it back to 1600 on base. I am always babying power back. I, I literally mean it when I say millimeters at a time. Vincent, the moment I have that runway made, power comes back to idle. And really, I want to be in a good position where I have that runway made. But I know that if all else fails, if I lost my engine right now, I am going to make it into that field. I smoothly bring that power back to idle and I float that thing on in there where I know I have the runway made or I know I have my aiming point made, my touchdown point made as well. By the way, your aiming point and your touchdown point, there should be some difference between those two. Hey, fun fact, and I'll come and take some more questions here. Did you know that at an FAA approved airport, like, like a legitimate FAA receives grants kind of airport, not you know Uncle Bill's grass strip down the road or anything like that, a legitimate FAA approved airport did you know that a center line is 120 feet long? Did you know the space between it before the next center line is 80 feet long? So private pilot ACS says I have nothing in front of my point and 200 feet beyond my point. So I have a box now. I can say from the beginning of the first center line stripe to the beginning of the second center line stripe, that's 200 feet. I now know where roughly my wheels need to touch down so I can actually see that. Commercial pilot, they give you 100 feet. Basically, if a centerline stripe is um, 120 feet, I need to touch down in the first good chunk, the first 80% of that centerline stripe. Or if you really want to be fancy and overachieve, put it in the blank spot, which is just 80 feet in between. Super fun. All right, uh, let's find some more questions here. Um, let's see over on Facebook. Hey, my buddy, Ralph, aviation uh, seminar at sea alumni, good friend of mine. How do you get out of the habit of getting very close to touchdown and just giving up and letting the plane do its thing? Ralph, 
And it's exactly what I said. Landon left of center line and kind of given up. It's lazy feet, my friend. Ralph, I need you to fly the airplane all the way back to the hangar, all the way back to the tie down spot. You have to do it. You have to remember, it's gonna take a little, just these baby control movements. I need you, Ralph, and you know this too, you've been following us for years, fly it all the way back to the hangar. You cannot get lazy the last 25 feet. That's how you end up left of center. That's how you end up with hard landings. It causes a lot of little issues here. Fly that thing all the way on down, transition the eyes way down towards that tree line. You cannot get lazy. The real flying happens in the last 25 feet, Ralph. That's not the point where we need to be given up, yet so many people actually do it here. Um, Jerry Swick on Facebook, good to see you, man. How about no flap landings? Whew, I love no flap landings, great to practice. I have a 1940 J3 Cub where no flap is the only type of landing you get to do. You get good at some slips coming in to actually land and work with it. No flap landings are great to practice. You can use slipping technique to slow down and to get down. You're gonna come in faster. You just have to be ready for that float. You have to have the runway for that float. And you need to realize, uh, Jerry and anybody, flaps or no flaps, if you're coming in faster, our control surfaces get more effective the faster we go. So if you're used to coming in at 70 and giving a little back pressure, if you give that same amount of back pressure, but you're at 80 knots, that's where you get the pops. That's where you get the little float ups. And now you're going, oh, geez, what do I do now? I kind of ballooned here. I didn't hit the ground. I just ballooned up. It's all because you gave the same amount of pressure you're used to giving at 70 when now you're at 80. Same control surface, more Bernoulli's principle happening, more airflow over it, thus making everything just more effective. That's why it's so crucial to manage these air speeds. Great, great question. Um, Devin asked a great question on Facebook. I love using Flight Simulator for practicing. Private pilot's tough. Private pilot, you can do things like VOR navigation, some basic instrument scanning. I really like simulators for my instrument flying. That's where we can get into my approaches, my instrument failures, my difficult holding patterns, the task saturation that you need to work on being an efficient instrument pilot. So uh, I love that when we can practice that. Let's give YouTube some love here. Adam Thomas, how is the 150 coming along? Adam is a diehard M0A fan and family member. Thank you for asking, Adam. Uh, 512 Romeo, uh, soon to be 512 Mike Zulu. We're finishing up, you probably saw the video on the EI install. We're finishing up the avionics. It should be next 30 days heading over to the paint shop. So really excited about that. We'll be documenting that entire process. Hey, something else cool. Uh, if you haven't seen on Facebook already, 2-3 Mike Zulu got its new wrap, same wrap, but new since the Oshkosh um, tornado uh, messed it up a little bit. It is all fixed up. Literally just, I think they finished the wrap literally today uh, or yesterday. So video coming out on that here awfully soon. But thank you for asking that here. Uh, hey, Holly, my, my good friend Holly Bot, Say hi to Amy as well. Hope you are doing well. A uh, Holly needs help with the old steep spirals. Holly's working on her commercial. Wow, steep spirals. Holly, what I typically do with my steep spirals, when I'm coming in, it's carb heat, power back. I need to put my point literally about where my landing gear would be on, on the 172. And I just come over to my 60 degrees, roughly. And remember, the ACS doesn't say I have to hold 60 degrees. The ACS says I, I need, it can go to 60 degrees and vary my bank angle to help me steep spiral eventually down and over that point. Holly, I'm sure you've seen the video. I did a, a video, gosh, probably four or five years ago. It was probably still in 7159 Quebec showing steep spirals over the Ocala airport. If you haven't seen already, that'd be a good one on YouTube, Holly, to go uh, dig up, but absolutely outstanding. Hey, M0 Nation, this time, well, a little bit earlier in this, 8 p.m. Eastern, August 19th, is the big announcement. I hope it is on your calendars. You don't want to miss it. I will be right here again in a week with something very, very cool to share here. Uh, let's just take uh, just a few more comments. I'll let you all get back to enjoying your evening, get this wonderful M0A.com team home here as well. Um, let's find some more looking. I'm looking here. Uh, curious. Uh, this is from Joe 
Why do I fly right seat solo? Because, Joe, you don't want to see me fly in the left seat. It's just not as good as in the right seat. you got to think. You have so many thousands of hours of sitting in that seat. I'm used to what's called the parallax, looking over, seeing those instruments. I can certainly fly in the left seat. I just fly better from the right seat. So much time instructing. So I even solo there. It's always funny when I solo in the right seat, I pull up to the FBO and the line guy comes over, the line gal comes over to the left side and they go, oh, you're over there. Okay, let me go over, <laughs> over there now. It just messes with them uh, maybe a little bit. Uh, all the uh, far aim says is I have to be in a position to reach all controls. I can fly in whichever seat. I should be able to reach all controls. And a 172, that's not too terribly hard to do, but... Just some great stuff. Devin says August 19th is his birthday. Devin, it'll be for your birthday too, but we have a huge announcement August 19th. So I'm very, very excited about that. But listen, m 0 Nation, I just want to thank you. You could be doing so many things tonight. Instead, you chose to be here. You chose to be here finding a way to better yourself as a pilot. You are truly such a blessing to myself and this amazing team here at m 0 You are the reason we just do all these crazy things. This team wakes up so early, stays up so late. It's nine o'clock here on the East Coast and many of us still have a, an hour more drive home. Um, but you know what? It doesn't feel like we have a job because what it really feels like is we get to interact with family every single day and you all are a part of that family. It is our mission to make everybody watching this a safer, smarter pilot. It is my mission to make sure you understand that just getting a good test on a written score, passing a check ride isn't enough. It is our mission that you pursue mastery in everything you do. It is my mission to see the photo of you and your spouse going on that dream cross country flight. It is my mission to see you flying to see the kids off at college. It is my mission to see you in that amazing career in aviation and careers in aviation will come back you think there was a pilot shortage, just wait. It's going to come back. You have chosen an amazing industry, an amazing hobby. Uh, you have chosen an amazing family to be a part of. So if you've been a member of our family for a long time, thank you. If this is your first interaction with us, welcome to the family. Family takes care of family in the hard times. We're in some tough times right now. If there is anything anything at all that myself and this amazing team here at m0a.com can do this week, this month, this year to make you that safer, smarter pilot, please, please, please don't hesitate to reach out. M0a family, M0a nation, have a wonderful rest of your evening and most importantly, remember that a good pilot is always learning. Have a great night, everyone. We'll see you.